So our next speaker is Mark D'Angelo. Uh, he is a fourth year PhD student in the curriculum and instruction program at Lynch School of Education. Mark was born and raised uh, in uh, New Jersey and received his bachelor's degree in geological sciences from Rutgers University and his master's degree in teaching from the College of New Jersey. Before attending DC, uh, he was a fifth grade classroom teacher and experienced critical incidents of practice around gender and sexuality that propelled him to pursue his PhD, specializing in inquiry issues uh, in education. Uh, with the past, for the past three years, Mark has been working uh, in the office of the Dean of Students as graduate assistant for LGBTQ plus students outreach and support. And this summer, we'll teach a course he developed for the Lynch School for the second year called Queering the Classroom. He ultimately hopes to secure a job working to support queer students uh, in higher education while staying abreast of the latest breaking developments on basically every show on Bravo. <laughs> well, let's welcome Mark. So what feminine part of yourself did you have to destroy in order to survive in this world? I bet everyone in this room can give me at least one answer to that. I can certainly give you many. When I think back to who I was as a little boy, I was outgoing, expressive, colorful, creative, sensitive, sassy, look at me gossiping on the phone already. <laughs> um, but I learned pretty early on that I had to change a lot about myself to survive in school, middle school, high school, college, the way I looked, act, dressed, talked, walked, behaved. See, it starts with the fact that we're all assigned a sex at birth, male, female, or intersex, based on internal or external characteristics. The problem is, too many of us conflate that with gender, and then by extension attach that to gender expression and gender identity. Gender is entirely socially constructed to express femininity and masculinity. And it's socially constructed as a very rigid binary system. Pink, blue, boy, girl, there's two scripts we're all supposed to follow until the day we die. Simone de Beauvoir was one of the first to point out, uh, feminist scholars to point out that one is not born, but rather becomes a woman, making that distinction between sex assigned at birth and a socialized gender, social constructed gender. Judith Butler built on that when she said that gender is performative and there are these sets of repeated acts that we're all socialized to learn so that we know how to perform our genders in the world. And then we go around saying things like be a man and act like a lady, which I think is hilarious because I think we're all inherently conceding that we know it's a performance if we all know how to act like a lady should act and how to be what a man should be. And then RuPaul sums it all up when she says that you're born naked and the rest is drag, which in, 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 inherently is saying what de Beauvoir and Butler are saying, that you're born blank and the rest is a performance as you walk through the world. And then you think about your gender expression and how many choices you make every day, week, month, year to express your gender and your gender identity, your innate sense of self as being either masculine, feminine, man, woman, some combination of those, none of those. There are seven billion people on this planet and if you think about how many different ways there must be to express your gender and how many different gender identities there must be, and yet somehow we've convinced ourselves selves that seven billion people fit perfectly into two discrete categories, because that makes perfect sense. So how do we get to this point? A pretty oppressive cycle of socialization that starts with us being born blank. No bias, no stereotypes, no preconceived notions of the world. But then we're first socialized by people we know, love, and trust, our caregivers, our teachers. We learn norms, models, ways to be in the world. And then that gets reinforced by cultural and institutional messages. Take television commercials, for example. Check out this 1953 Stop That Deodorant ad and pay close attention to the way masculinity is constructed. Well, sorry, Walt. It's all right, nothing broken. They don't tell me a big he-man like you uses a deodorant. Not a deodorant, Dan. Stop that spray deodorant. And there's nothing sissy about it. Ah, go on. No, please don't go on. Because <laughs> we learned in 15 quick seconds what it is to be a man. He's white, he's straight, he's a he-man, he's athletic, notice the locker room. He's very discreet about his appearances, he doesn't do anything to cause masculinity into question, and he's proud to smell like a man. So if you're a young boy growing up, you learn pretty fast. You better be white, you can't be queer, you can't be a sissy, you can't be a feminist. Don't do anything to call your masculinity into question, and you can't be pleasantly smelling. I mean, men are not lavender fresh. <laughs> Thankfully, television has come a long way. Check out this new Pine Sol ad. Powerful clean, powerful clean. Lavender fresh, lavender fresh. Lavender fresh. Powerful clean. Powerful clean. Delightful scent. Yes, it's, it's Pine Sol. So that was sarcasm. 
almost 70 years later in our cycle of socialization, and we're constructing gender virtually the same way. Powerful Clean is personified as the He-Man quarterback, Delightful Scent is personified as the dainty feminine cheerleader, and together they heteronormatively marry to create the perfect Pinefall product. Ding. <laughs> so as you can imagine, all these messages and aggregates are going to elevate and reward certain identities and are going to punish and stigmatize others which is going to lead to a pretty sloppy mess of hate and anger and violence and racism and homophobia and transphobia and internalized hatred. So in this cycle then, we reach a fork in the road. We can interrupt, take a stand, question in some small humble part what I hope this grad talk does, or we could do nothing, promote the status quo, and the cycle continues, driven at its core by these four words, fear, ignorance, insecurity, and confusion. Seven years ago, I was in this room behind me, my first classroom teaching a room full of fourth graders, one of whom was Peter, always outgoing, expressive, creative, artistic, sweet, reminded me a lot of myself, um, always smiling, but then his smile faded, and then his parents confided in me that he was being bullied and ostracized in the playground, and none of the boys would play with him in gym class. And then I asked my students, and they confirmed that no one wanted to go near him because he was expressing his femininity and masculinity in ways that were not okay, and he was being policed in fourth grade for it, and paying the price. And I failed Peter. I failed him in so many ways, and in so doing, I failed myself, and it's haunted me ever since. And in large part, it's one of the things that propelled me forward into this PhD program, working on queer equity in education at the Lynn School. And while I've been here at Boston College, I've served as the grad assistant for LGBTQ student outreach and support, supporting queer students on campus. And something I've learned pretty quickly is that we construct gender on this campus as narrowly and as oppressively as you would in an insular elementary school classroom except undergrads are going to police each other a lot more aggressively than my fourth graders police Peter. So in an attempt to unpack this toxic intersection between gender expression and queerness, when I do presentations around campus around gender and sexual identity, I made a point to ask the same series of four questions to my audiences using a live text wordle poll where you can anonymously text from your phone and the results come on screen. The bigger the word, the more times it's been texted. So my first question is, in one word or phrase, to the best of your ability, who is the BC girl? It should be woman, don't get me started, that's a whole nother grad talk. But who is the BC girl? This is what we see. Three and a half years of data, these audiences are sometimes hundreds of undergrads, sometimes dozens of faculty and staff. Look at how consistent this tiny box is in which a woman's supposed to exist on this campus. And if you're not any of these words, what words or phrases are used to police your identity? This is what we see. Notice how many of these words police the physicality and sexuality of a woman on this campus. What if you're different? What if you're athletic? What if you don't conform to Western standards of beauty? You'll pay the price. And what about if you're the typical BC guy? Who is that? These are the words that we see. What if you're sensitive, creative, artistic? What if you're not an athlete? What if you're Peter? What if Peter were an undergrad at BC right now? You're gonna be policed. And what words or phrase are used to police those identities? You can imagine. Notice how many of these words attack the feminine traits of a man. How many of them are rooted in misogyny? Because the worst thing a man could do is voluntarily relinquish his masculinity. So it's not surprising then that we're going to destroy the feminine parts of ourselves in order to survive. Where have I seen these constructions of gender before? I'm not sure. In the interim, what can we do to queer the way for gender? How do we celebrate and include people like Peter, gender non-binary folks, trans people, also, dismantling an oppressive gender binary liberates all of us. We all have something to gain from it. So what can we each do in our own capacities? For starters, how about we stop policing everyone's gender performance and gender expression? How about we stop policing our own? How about we stop assuming there are only two ways to be in the world, and how about you just be you? How about we look at social conventions and structures and institutions and systems that perpetuate these oppressive norms and force people into categories and boxes and constrain everyone's ways of being in the world? How about we look at our education system, the biggest engine of cultural reproduction we have, and think about in K-12 and higher ed institutions, do we have full-time staff members explicitly working on this? Do we have resource centers? Do we have public accommodations? Are our instructional materials and pedagogical practices, our textbooks, our school policies and curricula, are they inclusive of queer identities and different forms of expression, or do they contribute to the erasure of those identities? How about we stop lionizing and privileging and rewarding the most oppressive and harmful and dangerous interpretations and constructions of masculinity and femininity in our society. And instead, how about we celebrate, elevate, legitimize all kinds of masculinities, all kinds of femininities, all kinds of gender expressions and identities. 
there's this notion in our society that it takes courage to be who you are. How about we ask ourselves why and how we've constructed a society in which courage is necessary to simply exist? How about we take the onus off the individual to find courage and we all collectively find the courage to refuse to let these four words from forcing our complicity in this oppressive cycle of socialization. Where are we gonna be in another 70 years? The world is a classroom, and in it, we are all students. But more importantly, we are all teachers too. So how about we all stop failing, Peter? Thank you. <laughs>